I'm 34 and live alone in a rather large house. I was married and had kids, but I'd gotten divorced the year before. This house is meant for a large family, but I've never had the time to move out, so I just stayed. Being the only person in a large house, a lot of sounds resonate through the empty house all the time. The most common sound was from the air conditioner. It would make a hollow thud sound in the walls, which would then resonate through the house, sounding much louder than it actually was. Don't get me wrong, it was creepy at first, but I got used to it. Anyway, this happened on a Thursday night after I got home from a long day at work. I went straight upstairs and took my work clothes off to put something more comfortable on, then jumped on the bed and turned on the TV in my room. I didn't spend much time downstairs because I didn't need to. I had everything in my room, so the only time I would be downstairs for more than a couple minutes was if I was in the kitchen. I laid back and rested my eyes. After a moment, through the TV playing, I heard that familiar sound. I didn't even open my eyes, I just continued to rest. An hour later, somehow having not fallen asleep, I got up, getting hungry for dinner. I turned the TV off and opened my bedroom door, and almost on cue, that bang sound resonated again. I'd never recalled the AC making that sound more than once or twice a day, especially without touching the thermostat. I walked across the hallway to where the upstairs thermostat was. It was off, which means that it had been off all day. I wasn't fully scared yet though. My initial reaction was to try and figure out why the air conditioner was running while I had it off. I was really just upset that this inconvenience had to happen tonight. I went downstairs into the kitchen. The only thing I had left in my fridge was leftover pizza from a few days ago, so I set the oven and heated it up. I stood in the kitchen on my phone while I waited. Again, this time it was much louder and felt like it even shook the house. This was the moment I started to get scared. I hadn't convinced myself fully that this wasn't just the AC acting up, but other possibilities were starting to creep into my mind. Once the pizza was done, I ate quickly, then figured it best to go into the basement and check the AC unit. I didn't want to be creeped out the whole night, I just wanted to know what it was and be done with it. I opened the basement door and flicked on the lights. There was nothing special to this basement. It was unfinished and just had some old furniture, along with some boxes with seasonal decorations in them. I walked down the steps to the bottom, then walked over to the AC unit. I wasn't sure what to look for, so I was kind of just looking around for anything obviously wrong, and while I didn't find anything, I did notice that it was completely off. Nothing was running. It had to be something else, which was not giving me the peace of mind I was looking for. I started walking back to the stairs, planning to check some other rooms on the first floor, but just as I started walking, I saw a figure right under the steps. The lighting was dim, but his eyes gave away his position. The person was crouched down behind some boxes under the stairs. I knew he saw me looking at him as we were making eye contact and I had completely stopped walking. In hindsight, I wish I had pretended to not notice and continued walking, but in the moment I couldn't help my reaction. Once I snapped out of it, I sprinted up the steps and slammed the door behind me, locking it shut and putting a kitchen chair up against it. I didn't hear them following me, so I took it as a sign that they weren't here to fight. I called the police while standing next to the basement door in case they tried to escape. I was scared, but I also didn't want them to get away. I stayed on the line until the lady said the officers were three minutes away. Then I heard it again. The person down there was hitting something. Over and over, heavy blows hitting something solid. It seemed like either the concrete floor or the wall. From the resonance of the hits though, it felt too heavy to not destroy the wall, so I assumed the floor, but I had no idea why. After maybe 20 hits, it went silent. Moments later, officers came to the door. 
They captured the man downstairs quickly, and he surprisingly looked like a very normal man. Regular clothes, well-groomed. Didn't really look like he would be someone to break into a home. The officers brought up two tools as well. A thick crowbar and a large hammer. After retaining the man and putting him in the car, one of them brought me into the basement to show me what was going on. In the far corner, opposite of the AC unit, there was rubble and plywood shards all over the ground. I don't know how I didn't notice it. On the wall, though, were huge indents of metal. It was almost unrecognizable, but it was a small, old safe that was built into the wall. The damage that was done to the wall safe looked insane, and I was shocked that it hadn't given in. It's funny, though, because there was nothing in it. I do remember the seller mentioning it and giving me a code when we moved in, but I never bothered to stash anything in there. The officer I was talking to said they'd seen it before in a lot of the big homes around the area, as a lot of burglars go straight to the safe and often don't loot anything else in the house. Of everything, the fact that the man looked so normal is what creeped me out the most. Just knowing that literally anyone could be doing things like this is not a comforting thing to think about. I ended up repairing the wall and just covering the safe. I also plan to move out soon and get a smaller house that's easier for me to stay alert in. Because this situation could have been a lot worse than it was, and I don't want to take any chances next time. I was 16 at the time. My parents were away on a short vacation to celebrate their 20th anniversary. I acted sad when they left, but really I was super excited to be alone and have the whole house to myself. They left Friday morning after I went to school. When I got home, I made a quick snack with the food they left me, then went to the living room to play video games for the entire night. I had no school tomorrow and nobody was home to tell me to go to bed so I wanted to stay up as late as possible and enjoy the time I had. I was playing online with my friends for a while, but my buddies weren't as lucky as me, so at around 10pm, all of my friends had to hop offline. Come 11, or maybe closer to 12 even, my neighbor's dog started barking. They have a huge dog, so it was really loud even though their house was a good distance away from mine. I kept playing, but through the headphones I could still hear the dog barking like crazy for what had been a whole three or four minutes. It was really late, so I was both concerned and annoyed. When I found a good time to pause my game, I got up really fast and looked out the side window over at their house. None of their lights were on, but their dog was still barking. I was pretty sure it was barking from inside the house, too. Then I saw a man walking through their yard and onto the sidewalk. It was dark and hard to see, and I didn't see where he came from. Knowing the dog was probably barking at the guy by their house, and seeing him walking away, I went back to playing my game. I played for 15 minutes or so, before someone knocked on my door. It made me jump, but I was in the middle of a match, so I couldn't just get up. I kept playing, hearing the knocks continue. When the match ended, I took my headphones off and heard the knocks again. With my headphones off though, I realized it was coming from the back door, not the front door. Then I remembered how late it was and got really confused, but also a bit agitated. What could they possibly want from me this bad to be continually knocking on the door at midnight? I stood up but then I decided I didn't want them to see me and thought that if they realized nobody was home, then they'd leave and come back some other time. And if they stayed, then I'd know something was wrong. All the blinds were closed, so I didn't have to worry about that. I sat back down and continued playing. No more knocks came for a while after that. I played until almost 2 a.m., I was really tired and my eyes were struggling from staring at the TV for so long. I took my headphones off and turned off the TV, then went upstairs to get in bed. I laid in bed for a few minutes maybe, not very long, when I heard something outside.
a vehicle coming up our gravel driveway and stopping right in front of the garage. I stayed in bed, listening carefully. Someone got out of the car and closed their door, then walked around the house. I lost track of the footsteps once they made their way toward the backyard. A shiver ran through me. I got up and walked down the stairs slowly, still trying to not let anyone know I was home. But, about halfway down the stairs, I heard someone by the back door. It sounded like they were messing with the lock. I ran back upstairs and called the police. I tried not to sound panicked, probably because I was a stupid 16 year old and wanted to be cool, but they dispatched some officers to my house and told me to wait for 10 minutes until they arrived. I said okay and hung up the phone, then locked my bedroom door and waited. A minute later, there were a few noises coming from the back door. Then it opened. I heard someone walk in, then go into the living room. It sounded like they were taking things and putting them in a box. They moved quickly through each room downstairs, but after they went through the kitchen, they left, going back outside. I heard their car door open and close. I was relieved for just an instant before I heard footsteps reapproaching the house, coming back inside and into the last room downstairs. I guess they dropped the box off and came back for more. At this point, I was regretting not showing myself because the person downstairs really seemed to think nobody was home. He was making a lot of noise and was confident enough to come in for seconds. I was still sitting in my room just listening to this horrible event taking place below me, when the footsteps started coming up the stairs. They went straight for my parents' bedroom, which was right next to mine. They were in there for a while, then they came out and went up to my door. The handle shook. Then the footsteps immediately left, back down the stairs and out of the house. The car pulled out and was gone in seconds. My heart was beating rapidly and I was trying to control my breathing. I thought I was seconds away from having to fight for my life. When the police finally arrived, I told them everything. They called my parents too. After they checked around and finished getting info from me, the officers were confident that the person wasn't coming back now that he knew I was inside the home. Aside from all that, my console was stolen, along with a bunch of other expensive things. So not only was I horrified all week, but I was also left with nothing to do until my parents got home. I'm just happy that whoever was behind that door ran away and didn't try to break inside. Because if he saw me... I don't know what would have happened. I work from home most days of the month. Sometimes I have to go into the office to pick something up or have an in-person meeting, but that would only be once or twice a month. Working from home is really nice, but I often find myself getting distracted easily. On this day, I had a lot to get done and not a lot of time to do it. I was focused, working on my laptop in the office, when the doorbell rang. I rushed over to the door and opened it a crack, seeing a man on my porch. Can I help you? I asked. Hi, I'm looking for Mr. Peters, the man said, smiling at me. That was my name, but I didn't recognize him. That's me. What did you need? The man said he had important information to discuss with me, and asked if we could talk in more privacy inside the house. I first asked what the information was about, but he declined to give any details. I'm okay then, I said, closing the door. I went back upstairs to my office and started working again. A minute later though, the doorbell rang again. I knew it had to be the same man which started making me frustrated. I ran back down to the door and opened it, fully prepared to tell the man to leave, but he was already gone. There was no one at the door, and no cars or anything outside the house. I stuck my head outside and looked around, 
then closed the door again. The rest of the day went by without any more issues. I finished working, though had to do an hour of overtime. Once it got late, I shut off the TV and went upstairs to shower before bed. I turned on the water and was waiting for it to heat up when the doorbell rang again. I checked my phone, seeing it was half past ten. I wasn't going to open the door, but I wanted to see who it was, so I went back down and looked through the peephole. There was a man on the porch in dark clothing and with a face mask on. Even with the cover-up, I could tell it was the same man from earlier, based on his body shape and the way he was standing. My whole body froze, and I just watched him through the peephole. He rang the doorbell again. I could see he had something big in one of his pockets, either a large knife or a gun. It didn't even feel like any of this was really happening. I backed up quietly, but I think he may have heard me because he called out. I'm looking for Mr. Peters, just need to tell him something important. Thinking he knew I was there already, I ran upstairs and got my phone, calling 911. While on the phone, a gunshot ripped through the house. The sudden sound made my ears ring. I couldn't even hear what the officer was saying. The ringing faded over the next minute, and I heard nothing else. I was sure the guy had left, but I was still going to wait for the police. It was quiet for the whole time, until I heard sirens coming. Once they seemed to be nearby, I opened the bathroom door and stepped out and went over to the stairs. That's when I saw the front door was busted open, and not a second later, the man sprinted across the hallway and out the door, just before the cops pulled up. I think he had shot the lock out, and my ears were ringing so bad that I didn't hear him come inside. I gave the cops a description of the man, but there wasn't much else to go off of. The man was obviously at my home to hurt me, and likely kill me. He knew my name and had been looking for me. That's what still scares me. Until he gets caught, I don't think I'll ever get over the fear of him coming back. I worked as a babysitter during my college years just to make some extra money without having to have a set work schedule. For the most part, I took care of this one family's four-year-old boy a couple times a week, as the parents would often have dinner events for work. The boy was quiet, but I appreciated that because he was easy to watch over. He didn't do much besides watch TV and play with toys, and he seemed to like me. This was my sixth time watching after him. I had got to the house just before his parents left, and they explained that they would be back home around 11 tonight, and I needed to make sure that he was in bed by 9. The first few hours went as usual. I watched TV with him and made him a small frozen pizza. After finishing his food, he told me he had to use the bathroom and left for a few minutes. When he returned, he asked me about the shuffling noises coming from the basement. I was confused and immediately turned off the TV. Sure enough, as soon as the TV was quiet I could clearly hear something moving around down there. It was very faint though and I couldn't tell what it was. Seeing the boy was clearly scared, I assured him it would be okay and was probably just a small animal that had gotten in. I told him to wait up here while I go down to see what it was. By this point, the shoveling had already stopped. I'd never been in the basement of this house before, as it was unfinished and there was never any reason to go down there, so I was definitely being cautious. I opened the door and turned on the light by the stairs, then I walked down quietly and turned the light on at the bottom of the stairs too, which lit up the whole room. It was a pretty big space, mostly filled with storage boxes. I walked around, checking behind a few boxes, but after not seeing or hearing anything else, I went back upstairs. The boy was waiting for me on the couch, and shot up when he saw me. I told him everything was fine and nothing was down there, and gave him a big hug just to make him feel better. 
After a few minutes, we had already forgotten about the whole thing. And a couple hours later, it was getting close to 9 o'clock and I started to get him ready for bed. We went upstairs to his room and I made sure he was ready, then said goodnight and went back downstairs. I sat on the couch for probably 30 to 40 minutes just scrolling through my phone before hearing shuffling from the basement again, but this time it was a lot louder. My heart stopped for a second as I listened. Then I heard the bedroom door open upstairs and the boy call out my name. I told him to stay where he was and not to come down. I got up and made my way to the basement door. At this point, I was pretty terrified. I pulled out my phone and had it ready to call 911 as I opened the door as quietly as possible. The shuffling sounded like it was close to the bottom of the stairs now. I reached over and flicked on the lights. Immediately, I slammed the door shut and ran upstairs to get the boy, then went straight out the front door and called 911. I stood across the street from the house, looking at the windows as I waited for the cops to come. I also called the parents to let them know what had happened and to come home as soon as they could. When the police finally arrived, I told them what happened. As I turned on the lights by the stairs, I saw a half-naked man crouching down by the bottom while searching through a storage box. They carefully searched the home and found clear evidence of someone having lived in the basement recently, with piles of trash shoved in boxes, but they didn't find anyone. When the parents arrived, they thanked me for calling them and talked to the police about the situation. About an hour later, I was able to go home as they secured the house and filed the reports. I spent the next few days really shaken up and being pretty paranoid. For a couple of weeks, I kept in touch with the parents to see if there were any updates on the man, but nothing ever came up. Eventually, we lost touch as I no longer wanted to babysit anymore. I think the most terrifying thing about it was that he never got caught, and he could be living in someone else's basement right now without them even knowing. When I was 13, I had a babysitter that would come once a week, as my mom would work late every Saturday night. I always thought I was too old to have a babysitter still, and hated having to have someone watch over me all the time. The main person my mom would have over was a 20-year-old guy, Thomas, that was the son of one of my mom's work friends. This guy was really weird, and I didn't like him at all. He didn't talk much and just acted really awkward and strange, but whenever he interacted with my mom, he would act extra nice and talkative. I would bring it up with her, but she'd always say I was just trying to get rid of him so I could be alone. Anyways, it was a normal Saturday night, and Thomas had just arrived, a little late as usual. My mom talked with him for a little bit, and then headed to work. I walked over to the couch, and turned on my Xbox to play some video games just to pass the time. I'd usually go to bed at 10, so I'd have to spend 4 or 5 hours with Thomas. Most of the time, I'd find something to do alone because he'd never really talk to me and would just hang out in the kitchen or in our loft area. And today was no different. He stayed in the kitchen for a little bit, and after a few minutes, I heard him talking to someone. I tried to listen as best I could, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. The kitchen was right behind the living room that I was in, but he was talking really quietly. He went on for a few minutes, and then the talking stopped, followed by him coming into the living room and standing next to the couch. I looked up at him and saw he was holding his phone. Thomas said someone was going to come over, just for a second and not to worry. I didn't really know how to respond other than to just say, okay. It was pretty weird though, and I knew it was definitely not something any babysitter should do, but I also knew that there was nothing I could really do about it. The next 20 minutes were really awkward, as he didn't take out his phone or anything. He just sat there on the couch with me, looking around and not saying anything. He would rarely ever be in the same room as me, so this was pretty out of the ordinary. Our living room was right by the front door though, so I guess he was just waiting for the person to get here. 
Eventually, a car pulled into the driveway and a man came knocking at the door. Thomas shot up and went over to the door, then stood right in front of it for a moment before turning to me and telling me that he'd be back in just a minute. Then he opened the door and walked outside and shut the door behind him. This whole situation had me curious as to what was going on with him. The blinds on the windows were cracked open just enough for me to see the two of their shadows as they moved around in the driveway. I could tell that the man handed Thomas a large bag and then got in his car and drove away. A few seconds later, I heard the lid of the garbage can outside slam shut, followed by Thomas coming back inside through the front door. The whole interaction seemed odd and I couldn't help myself from asking him what it was all about. Thomas replied telling me that it was just his friend and that he left his wallet at his friend's house last night so he was just dropping it off. I could tell there was something wrong with the way he answered and it didn't explain the large bag I saw him holding but I didn't want to question him any further so I just said okay and went back to playing my game. But things got a lot more strange as the night progressed. During the next hour, I could hear Thomas having multiple phone calls with someone in the kitchen, and at one point, he went into the far loft area where I could hear him raising his voice. Still though, I couldn't make any sense of what he was saying. After maybe the fifth or sixth call, the same car from earlier pulled into the driveway again, and Thomas immediately ran outside without saying anything. I could tell from their body language and the way that they were moving around that they were clearly arguing about something. Then Thomas left for 30 seconds and then came back with the bag from earlier. The man took it and put it in his back seat and then drove off in a hurry. Thomas came back inside and I could see the frustration on his face. He went over to the kitchen and didn't come back until 10 when he told me I had to go to bed. I got ready and laid in bed while Thomas stayed downstairs. He would usually stay until my mom got home at 12, but just a few minutes later I heard the front door open and close. I waited for 10 minutes, then got up and went downstairs to see if he was still there, but sure enough he had left. I looked out the window and his car was gone too. I stayed up in bed for a few hours to wait for my mom to get home and then told her everything that had happened. She seemed to believe me this time, as she also thought it was strange and really unprofessional to leave the house before she came home. The next day, she tried calling him, but he didn't answer. Eventually, though, she got a hold of her friend, who was Thomas's mom, and asked what happened, and she said that Thomas came home feeling sick. We both knew that was a lie and didn't make much sense as he could have just called her and told her he wasn't feeling well. Anyways, it's been almost 10 years since all that happened and I still find myself thinking about how weird that night was. I always wonder what the two were arguing about, why he left, and what was in the bag. My best friend had a daughter, Sarah that had just turned seven and I would occasionally watch her whenever they needed. They lived in a really nice home in Washington, surrounded by trees and mountains. The nearest neighbors were a couple miles away, so I always enjoyed the peace and quiet while staying there. Anyways, my friend had asked me if I could watch Sarah for two days while she was going on a business trip. I agreed and a few weeks later arrived at her house. We talked for a little bit and ate lunch together, then she finished packing and headed out to catch her flight. I hung out with Sarah for a few hours, listening to her talk about school and her friends. Then I took her out to pick up some dinner and dessert. We got back to the house around 8 and agreed to watch a movie just before bed. I sat on the couch and began scrolling through a list of movies to find one when I hear Sarah ask me, who's that? I look where she's pointing, at the front door, and then hear someone knocking. With the house being so isolated, I never thought anyone would come up to the door. Nervously, I walked over and cracked the door open. There was a tall man standing on the porch. He looked a little surprised when I opened the door. Can I help you? I asked. 
He leaned to the left, looking through the crack in the door, then replied, Sorry, just making sure someone was home. Then he turned away and started walking. Obviously, I found this very strange and a little bit creepy. I closed the door and locked it, then went to the back door and locked it as well. Sarah asked me who it was, and I told her it was just a neighbor, then went back to the couch and started a movie. We both enjoyed the movie, though it was a little bit longer than I had thought. I told Sarah it was time for bed, and then followed her upstairs as she got ready. Once she was in bed, I came back down and sat on the couch. It was a little bit after 10, and I wasn't too tired yet, so I figured I'd turn something on the TV and just wind down for a bit before going to bed. As the TV played, I started to hear a crunching sound coming from somewhere. I muted the show and listened more carefully. It was coming from the back of the house. I went over to the back door and turned on the back porch light. Looking around, I couldn't see anything other than an empty porch with trees in the background. I stayed there, listening for a few more minutes before eventually heading back to the couch. I wondered if my mind was just messing with me, as I was a little creeped out by being in a house surrounded by a forest in the dark. I always felt safe during the day and actually really enjoyed it, but as soon as the sun goes down, I'd get a little uneasy. Anyways, I turned up the volume again and decided to lay down as to get myself more sleepy. Apparently it worked too well and I fell asleep on the couch shortly after. A couple hours later, I woke up, noticing the TV was still on. I turned it off and sat up, rubbing my eyes tiredly. But then I started to get an uneasy feeling again, as I noticed how silent it was in the house. There wasn't any sound at all. Then I began to hear that same crunching sound, but this time clearly sounding like footsteps. It was coming from the right side of the house, which was right by the room that I was in. A few seconds later, they stopped, seemingly right outside one of the windows that had the curtains down. Truly frightened, I walked over to the window slowly and quietly, and pulled back the curtain. Nothing was there. I looked around and didn't see anything. I figured I had been imagining it and was just really tired, so I got a glass of water and headed upstairs to get to bed. The next morning, I made us some breakfast and we sat down together to talk about what we wanted to do today. But as we were discussing plans, Sarah asks me why I was walking around outside last night. I froze for a moment then asked her what she saw. She said she had heard someone walking around the house for almost an hour just after she had gone to bed. Chills ran down my body, and I told her to stay inside while I went to look around outside. I grabbed a small knife just in case, and went out the front door. Walking around the house, it was hard to tell if anything was from last night or had already been there but I did notice some scratches on the walls near some of the windows and doors, but other than that, everything seemed normal. I couldn't tell if there were any footprints, as the yard was mostly thick grass. As I made my way back to the front door, I saw that same man from yesterday walking down the street in front of the house. He was just walking past, but again, this house was pretty far from anything else, so he had to have walked a couple miles at least just to get there. I went back inside and told Sarah that we were going to go to the mall today and walk around. I really didn't want to be in the house anymore, so I wanted to spend as much time away as possible. We stayed out for a while and didn't get back to the house until 6. My friend called me soon after just to check up on us. I mentioned the strange man that I had seen and described his features to her, and she actually said that she recognized the man from a few weeks ago. Apparently he had come up to her house and asked if he could stay the night, to which she obviously declined. We agreed that if anything else happened, I wouldn't take any chances and would call the police. 
As the sun started to go down, I made sure to check all the doors one last time to make sure that they were locked. It was around 9 p.m., and Sarah and I were playing a quick board game before bed when we both started to hear a soft tapping noise coming from outside one of the windows. I stood up slowly and told Sarah to stay calm, but then a loud scratching came from outside the walls of the house, right by the window in the room we were in. I grabbed Sarah and ran into the garage. We got in the car and I backed out of the driveway as quick as I could, making sure the garage fully shut before driving off. I couldn't see much in the darkness as we were leaving, but Sarah said that she saw someone running into the trees behind the house. I pulled into a hotel parking lot and called the police to report the incident, then called my friend to let them know what had happened. We were met ten minutes later by two officers at the hotel, and they informed us that two more were at the house looking around. I told them everything and gave them a description of the man, and eventually they left. We ended up staying in a room at the hotel for the night. The next morning, my friend called and said her flight was just landing and she would be back in an hour, so we headed over to the house. We waited in the driveway for her to arrive, then we all went in together to make sure it was safe. I stayed for a few hours just to talk about everything, and then I said goodbye and went home. It was definitely one of the scariest things to ever happen to me. But fortunately, the man was caught a month later after having been reported by multiple people for trying to break into their homes. What scares me the most about the guy was that he never said what his reasoning was for his actions. He had apparently broken into one of the homes, but he didn't steal anything at all. He just looked around for a little bit and then left empty-handed. It always makes me wonder what he was actually trying to do on the night he tried to break in. I was doing my Sunday night drives for extra money with DoorDash and Uber Eats. My friends show me how to use both at the same time and make more money per hour. One of the biggest issues with doing delivery services is that you have a lot of downtime where you just drive around waiting for an order to pop up. But if you work both apps at the same time, you can get rid of all that downtime and constantly be making money. So I was doing this for a few hours, racing back and forth between houses and restaurants, when I got a small order from a nearby restaurant, but the house was far away. These are the worst kinds of orders because you drive far and get paid less. Though this one offered a large amount, meaning the tip must be crazy big. Accepting it, I picked up the order and began the 25 minute drive to their address. Halfway through the drive, while on a side road, I got a call from the app, assumingly being the customer. I answered, asking if this was my Uber Eats customer. A man confirmed he was my customer and apologized profusely saying he ordered from his friend's account and forgot to change the address. He said his house was just around the block though and he proceeded to give me directions, telling me a couple turns to take once I reached the friend's house. I asked him for the address just in case I got lost, but he responded saying I'll see him outside waiting for him, then hung up. Obviously, this shit was not normal. However, I was more than halfway there at this point, and I gave the man the benefit of the doubt, as forgetting to switch it from your friend's address seemed like a legit thing that could happen. It could have also been the fact that I was a bigger guy that helped me convince myself to go through with the delivery, as I wasn't really afraid of anything. When I got to the supposed friend's house, I took the turns as the man had said and drove down a dimly lit neighborhood road until I reached a no outlet sign and saw the road ended just a few houses down. Feeling confident I had taken the turns as the man had said, I pulled over and grabbed my phone to call the customer. Just as I was clicking into my recent calls, a knock at my driver window made me jump. A bit embarrassed at how noticeably startled I was, I rolled the window down to greet him, but looking up at the man, his face had no emotion, just a completely straight, blank face. I let go of the window button and immediately pressed the lock button, 
which was followed by the man sticking a gun through the half-open window right at my head as he yelled out something. I heard more voices call back, followed by a group of people running up to the car and trying to open the door handles. They were all yelling commands at each other, but in the heat of the moment, I couldn't make out what they were saying. I was in a full-on shock, staring into the barrel of this guy's gun. If I had to guess, there were at least five or six people surrounding my car. In this moment, I don't even remember having any thoughts, but I can only describe it as more of a reflex type reaction, because when the man holding the gun looked away for a split second, I suddenly slammed on the gas, flooring it down the street. I'm surprised the man even held on to his gun as he pulled his hand out of the window just in time. Seeing the end of the road though, I quickly did a three point turn and when I faced the other end of the street again, they were all gone. Not a single one of them anywhere on the road, sidewalk, or by the houses. They must have just fled the scene the instant I began driving. As soon as I made it out of the neighborhood, I called 911. These gang type attacks are relatively common around here, but I never thought it would happen to me. Although nothing came of it, with nobody being found and every piece of evidence leading to nowhere, I see this event as a sort of wake up call for me. I realized in the moment that the man put a gun to my head that being a big, confident man meant absolutely nothing. Taking a risk like that was purely stupid because literally anyone with a weapon can have your life in their hands in an instant. If you work a job like this, or do anything where you see strangers regularly, be careful, because putting yourself in a risky situation with a stranger could be the last thing you ever do. During COVID, delivering groceries became pretty popular, and even after, people still had them delivered to their house. I was a picker for those orders, and when we were understaffed, which was pretty much all the time, I was also dropping them off. It wasn't a bad job, I actually enjoyed driving to people's homes. I got to see nice houses, and I didn't have to deal with the constant questions from customers, so I wasn't complaining. I got tips sometimes too, which was nice. Most of the time though, I left the groceries at the doorstep, took a picture as proof, and then left but I did have moments where I got to meet the people and help them take in the groceries. One instance was this older lady from Serbia. Her name was Vesna and she loved me. We got to know each other cause every Thursday she'd have pretty much the same stuff ordered to her house at the exact same time. The first few times I dropped off her groceries, she never came outside, but I'd catch her peeking out the window at me. I'd give a little wave, take my picture, then get back in the truck and leave. I think once she realized it was the same person delivering her groceries every time, she got more comfortable. She came out and greeted me, then slowly over time I started bringing in the groceries for her and setting them on her counters. She was pretty old so I was happy to help, and she also tipped nicely too. The more I went, the more I got to know her. She was recently widowed and lived alone. All her children lived far away and she only saw them once or twice a year for the holidays when she could take the train. She was also retired, but she used to be a broker, which explained her nice house. I always looked forward to Thursdays, and this one was no different. She had ordered everything on Monday, as she always did, and I was dropping off the following Thursday. When I pulled into the driveway, I immediately noticed that something was off. She wasn't at the door like she usually was, but the door was open. I also noticed that all her blinds were closed, which was strange. She always kept them open so her plants could get some sun. I went up to the open front door, and not seeing her, I rang the doorbell. I waited for a bit, but there was no answer. I knocked a few times, and there was no answer again, so I naturally started to become a little worried. She was old, so my immediate thought was maybe she fell or had a heart attack or something. I kind of stood there wondering what I should do. I thought maybe I should go inside, but I was also on the job, and I know the rules are that if no one answers, I just have to leave the groceries on the porch. Being her friend though, 
I decided it best to go inside and at least put her groceries on the counter like usual. The door was open, after all. I grabbed all the bags in both of my hands and walked straight into the kitchen. All the lights were off and everything was quiet. Placing the bags on her counter, I called out her name, again hearing no response. As I started walking out, calling the police crossed my mind, but I didn't really know how to explain this was an emergency because what if she was just out of the house? Maybe she was just visiting someone, and I just wasted the police officer's time. I really was in a weird position, but I just knew something was wrong. But just as I got to the doorway leading outside, I heard movement in the house upstairs. I felt relieved for a moment, calling out for Vesna, but then there was again no response. No one came to the door or answered me. After a minute of standing there, I kept hearing shuffling movement as if someone was moving stuff around upstairs and started to feel really awkward and uncomfortable. I headed back outside and got in the car. I sat there for a little while and after a minute I saw the curtains on the second story move to the side as if someone was looking at me through the window. I pulled out and drove around the corner, then parked on the street and sat there just really confused. I didn't know if it was her and she just didn't want to see anyone, or maybe one of her kids. I was also concerned with whether or not I should call the police. I drove off, went around the block, and then decided to drive by her house again. I sat there for a little while again, until I saw the upstairs curtains open. I saw a male figure look out, and then closed it quickly as if seeing my truck scared him. I knew Vesna had two daughters, and she had a son, but he had passed away years ago, so I'm not sure who could possibly be at her house with her not there, and where would she be anyway? I had been there too long though, and had to get back to work. The following week, there were no orders from her for the first time in almost a year. I drove by her house after I got off on Thursday, and in the driveway was an officer's car. When I got home, I searched her name and found that she had been filed as missing only a few days after I had been there to deliver her groceries. I noticed the date they said she was likely last at home though was the day after she had ordered the groceries. Two days before, I had gone to her house and saw that man. I went to the police with all the information I had. I don't know who that man was or if I was close to having something happen to me as well. But it's been nearly three years now, and there have been no updates. Being a delivery driver for several pizza places a few years back, I had a lot of experiences with weird customers or just strange things that would happen at night. But this one night takes the prize for the most disturbing and unusual situation. I had been working at the specific chain pizza shop for just under a year. I worked mid shifts and night shifts alongside one other coworker for the most part. It would stay busy basically up until closing at 2 a.m., so there wasn't a ton of time to mess around, especially since it was just the two of us. I'll call my coworker Tom to keep his privacy. Tom was older than me by a few years and was a quiet, hard worker. He was in charge during the night shifts and would make all the pizzas while I would deliver them. Both of us would answer calls though, depending on who was busy and who wasn't. Anyway, it was just past 11pm and I had gotten back from a delivery when the phone rang. Seeing Tom in the middle of making a pizza, I picked up the phone. A man on the other line spoke, asking for a large sausage pizza. I put in the order and asked if he needed anything else. The man didn't answer for a moment, then he repeated himself, saying that he'd like a large sausage pizza. This time, I could tell through the way he mumbled it out that he was likely drunk. I confirmed that he just wanted one pizza, and the man said yes. I sent the order through, then grabbed my next delivery and dropped it off. Getting back to the shop, Tom had finished the guy's order and prepped it for delivery, so I grabbed it off the counter and ran to my car. I noticed, as I was grabbing the order though, Tom was giving me a weird look, as if he wanted to say something to me, 
but he decided not to. Again though, Tom was pretty quiet and soft-spoken, so it wasn't very odd. The address was a good 15 minutes away, but there was no traffic at this time, so I got there pretty early. The house was normal, but had a lot of land on either side, with the neighbors' homes barely visible through the trees. I got out and went around to the passenger door to pick up the pizza, then I headed up to the porch and knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a man came and opened the door wide open. This wasn't all that strange, but I always found it odd when people would open their door that wide, as it was just unnecessary. But his face when he saw me seemed very confused and surprised, as if he hadn't expected to see me. Figuring he was just drunk and out of it, I handed him the box and told him his total, to which he slowly and awkwardly handed me cash, not saying anything. He held the box of pizza while standing in front of me and looked at it with a strange intensity. Then he moved his eyes up towards me, but not at me. He was looking over my shoulder like he saw something, but was just staring at it with that same intensity before shaking his head slowly like he was saying no. Getting really uncomfortable watching this man, I couldn't help but look back. I turned my head over my right shoulder and looked toward the driveway. Just a few feet from my car was a hooded man running back toward the trees. My heart jumped and I felt my body go into a sort of shock, trying to figure out what to do. I turned back around to face the man at the door, but he immediately stepped back and slammed the door shut. It all happened so fast, in just a matter of seconds, and gave me no time to react. With the door closed in front of me, I turned to face the hooded man again, but he was lost in the dark tree line. I stumbled off the porch and ran to my car, backing out of the driveway as soon as possible and driving back to work. I calmed myself during the drive, but still couldn't understand what happened. When I got back, I told Tom about the encounter who seemed to have very little reaction and rather just told me to deliver the next order when I was ready. I did as he said, but on my way back from the delivery, I ended up pulling over and calling the police to let them know just in case. They said they would have an officer check it out and call me back to update me. I got a call an hour later and once I got out of work, I waited in the parking lot for the police to show up and talk to me. When the officer came up to my car, he mentioned that he talked to the man at the residence who matched the description I gave him, and the guy told the officer that he was just waiting for his buddy, Tom, to show up since he knew he worked at the pizza shop. When asked about the hooded man, he gave no details, saying he didn't know anything about that and he didn't see anyone. With that information, I was even more horrified and confused. I thought maybe they called thinking Tom was a delivery driver and were setting him up so that they could jump him. That would explain the hooded man by my car and the surprise of the guy at the door. I also think back to that look Tom gave me, thinking maybe he was going to warn me of something. I talked to Tom on multiple occasions about it though, but he gave me quick, useless answers, saying the guy was just an old friend and that he didn't know anything about anything. I moved on to another pizza shop very soon after that incident. But now that the horror of the situation is in the past, and I know it likely wasn't a target on me specifically, I enjoy trying to figure out the mystery. I still don't know for sure what the situation was, but it was by far the strangest and creepiest I've ever had. Winter is my favorite season of the year. There's just something about the feeling of snow falling and holidays that puts me in a good mood all throughout. However, I live in a fairly cold state, often causing tons of snowfall during these winter months. Being a DoorDash driver part-time for almost three years at the time, it would make this job much more difficult as the roads would take a while to get plowed, and even when they did, the heavy snowfall would just cover up the roads again. While it made the job dangerous and sometimes even impossible, I still usually chose to drive on days of heavy snow and covered roads. Reason being, nobody else would be out on the road and other DoorDash drivers would likely stay home, giving me access to a lot more orders and the possibility to make more money. Plus, customers tend to tip more as they know they're putting you through a lot by ordering for delivery during a blizzard. All was the same that year, and it was the middle of December when a night of heavy snowfall came around. I wasn't able to start deliveries until 7 or 8 due to my other job, 
but as soon as I was able, I began driving. Like usual, very few cars were on the road, and my DoorDash app was giving me high-paying offers for delivery. I did two relatively quick orders and was on my way back from a house before the snowfall worsened. The visibility was awful and the roads were not being plowed often enough. My car wasn't a piece of junk, it had all-wheel drive and all-season tires, but this snow was really making me struggle. I slowed to a stop sign and was barely even able to start moving again as my tires just spun under me. Finally passing through the intersection, another order popped up on my phone. I looked at it for a second, fighting with myself whether or not to do it, before eventually rejecting it and closing the app. The roads were too dangerous, even for me. The specific street I was on wasn't very far from the main town, so my goal was to just get as close to town as possible, hoping that more snowplows had uncovered the roads. I drove slowly, going 20 on a 45. As I rolled through the poor conditions, I barely made out something large in the middle of the road ahead of me. Having been unable to see it until it was too late, I slammed on the brakes, and while my car had stopped in time, the back tires slid behind me and dragged my car off the road and into a thick layer of snow. Thankfully, it was a soft, low-speed crash, but it didn't help the state I was in. My car was completely stuck in the snow now, and I knew I'd need assistance. I gathered myself together, remaining calm and collected, then turned my hazard lights on and took my phone to call for roadside assistance. I gave the man my location, who then said it would take about 15 to 20 minutes for him to arrive. I happily agreed and thanked him. Leaning back in my seat, I was glad I hadn't accepted any orders since it would make this whole thing a lot more complicated. A few minutes went by as I just sat there watching the snowfall before noticing a flickering light in my side mirror. It was hard to see, but I was able to make out that it was an orange light, flashing softly and coming towards me. As it got closer and parked on the side of the road behind me, it looked like a typical work vehicle with the caution lights on top. Looking back at my phone, it had only been four minutes since I called, so this guy was really early, but I wasn't about to complain about someone for coming early to dig me out of a ditch. After waiting in my car for another couple minutes, I heard a door slam shut behind me and saw a man walking toward my window. Once he was a few feet away, I rolled it down a few inches. Hi sir, did you need assistance here? He said. Yeah, I called a few minutes ago. I just needed help getting back on the road. I responded, though it felt a bit weird explaining myself as the situation was pretty obvious. Right, let me see what I can do for you. The man walked around to the back of my car and began inspecting it, assumingly looking for a place to set up the hook. Now, I've never done this before, but I always assume they attach a winch to your car and drag you out. I had no idea where they attached it or anything, or even if that's what they actually do. The man stood behind the car for a bit as I watched in the rearview mirror. Then, a sudden rush of cold air shot through as the man had opened the trunk. I looked back and saw him holding the trunk half open, while scanning the inside of my vehicle with his eyes. Sorry, he muttered, slamming the trunk closed. Again, I didn't know how this process worked, but it was really weird that he randomly opened my trunk like that. I couldn't think of a reason that he'd possibly need to open it for. My suspicions started rising, noticing he was clueless and I started putting pieces together. I quickly called the roadside assistance number again. A few rings went by as I waited anxiously before the same man as last time picked up. My stomach dropped. Hey, I'm just a couple minutes away. Did you need something else? Just then, the guy came back up to my window, telling me that he needed my keys and for me to exit the vehicle for a minute while he prepared it. I kept the phone by my ear, then awkwardly told the guy that I just needed a minute as I was on the phone. He didn't respond, but rather just stood there watching me, as if wanting to listen to my conversation. I was trying my best not to panic. With the guy still next to my door, I rolled the window up. The man immediately began knocking on the window, asking me what I was doing in a rather aggressive tone. I then locked the doors, and as soon as he heard that, he tried pulling my door open and began yelling at me. I was terrified, knowing I couldn't go anywhere. 
As this was going on, I heard another door slam shut from the truck behind me and saw another man running towards my car with something in his hand. Then, an extremely loud horn blared from behind us, followed by bright lights shining at my car. The two men ran back to their truck and immediately drove away, revealing the roadside assistance truck. Two men got out and came up to make sure that I was okay. Apparently I'd left the call on, and the men heard what was going on, so they rushed to help me. Also, after notifying the police, I found out that there were multiple cases very similar to mine that happen when we get heavy snowfall. The men supposedly drive around looking for people that are stuck, then steal their cars and rob them while pretending to be roadside assistants. I wouldn't even doubt if they were the ones that put that large object in the street that caused me to swerve and slide off the road. I'm lucky for the way the events played out though, and I don't think I'll ever drive in bad conditions again. My uncle had offered me to look after his house while he went on vacation with his family in Europe. My aunt and cousin had already left in advance while my uncle had to finish up some business first. Once he finished everything he had to do, he asked me to take care of the house for a few weeks. He knew how much I wanted to live alone, so he offered me this opportunity to experience it for the first time. He forbid me from inviting any friends over or hanging out in the yard too much. I didn't understand why, but I assumed he didn't want me to walk outside too much as the large amount of snow that had accumulated could cause an accident. After giving me many instructions on how to take care of the house, he left me a large amount of food in the refrigerator, then left. I must admit that at the beginning, it was actually better than I expected. I didn't feel uncomfortable being alone, and I actually felt I could do whatever I wanted. Everything was going perfectly, until the middle of the night, a noise woke me up. More surprised than scared, I got up quickly and looked around. There was nothing just the darkness of my uncle's room illuminated by the intense moonlight coming through the window. I looked out the window to see if it was snowing, and to my surprise, not only was snow falling, but it looked like there was a blizzard outside. Surprised, I stared outside unaware of what was actually going on. I turned around quickly when I heard the same noise come from the front door downstairs. This was the moment my heart started beating faster. I thought possibly something had blown up against the door, but I wasn't sure. I went downstairs, turning on all the lights on the way, and looked out the peephole of the front door. Seeing nothing, I opened the door a crack, trying not to let the cold or snow inside. To my horror, there were footsteps leading straight to the door. I slammed the door shut and locked it, breathing heavily. Who the fuck would be outside in this weather? I said under my breath, looking around the house as if to figure out what to do next. I ran over to the back door, looking through the glass. It was too dark and snowy to see anything more than a few feet away, but through the snow, I could have sworn I saw a very small person walking away from the house. It looked like a kid, no older than 9 or 10. A brief lightening of the wind allowed me to see more clearly for a split second and sure enough, there was definitely a kid walking around outside the house. I was scared, but also worried for the small child. I ran upstairs to get my phone, then called 911 to report the kid by my house. I stayed by the back window, looking out into the snowy darkness to see if the kid showed up again, but they were gone. When the cops showed up, I let them know the situation in more detail. We stood in the kitchen as I talked, but were interrupted by a quiet knock at the front door. One of the officers told me to stay here, while they both went to see who was at the door. As the officer opened it, that same child from earlier was revealed. An officer brought the kid inside, clearly worried as the boy wasn't wearing a thick jacket or anything, just a light sweatshirt. The other officer stepped outside, looking around for anyone else then closed the door behind him as he re-entered the house. The expression on the kid's face was hard to describe, as it just seemed totally blank. The officer was asking a lot of questions, like where his parents were and what he was doing, but the boy barely spoke, and seemed to just be lost, as in, lost in the head, not really understanding what was going on. It was all so surreal, happening right in front of me, yet it didn't feel real at all. What kid just walks around in a blizzard in the middle of the night? 
Why did he knock on the door? Why was he alone and expressionless? We didn't get answers for weeks. By then, my uncle was back and no longer needed me to watch the house. Of the few words the boy spoke, he had told the investigators that the house I was at, my uncle's house, was where he lived. However, two weeks after I found him, another family positively identified the boy as their lost child from months ago. Keeping up with this news, my mind was spinning, but things continued to get stranger. Not even a month later, another missing kid was found sitting in the street in front of my uncle's house while he was on vacation again. Apparently there's no connection between the two missing kids, but it seems a little too coincidental to me. It made me question everything, like why my uncle wanted nobody over and for me to stay out of the yard. Was he doing something I didn't know about? Why did he leave several days after his family left? Was he possibly keeping people somewhere? Obviously, I could be completely overthinking everything, but who knows? The cops checked the house after the first boy was found, and my uncle was compliant with everything. So, it could be a great coincidence of two missing children being found outside his home, or it might not be a coincidence at all. My family and I would go up north to go ice fishing when I was younger. My parents had friends that owned some cabins in pretty much the middle of nowhere. There was a small gas station about a mile away, but after that, it would take about 20 to 30 minutes to see anything else. On our way up, snow was starting to fall, and I just wanted to get settled in and play some games. It was an 8 hour drive to get where we were going, and it would be around 4pm when we finally arrived. It was January, so the sun was starting to set already, and I was pretty tired. We pulled into our cabin's parking lot and started to unload. The cabins had smart locks, so all you had to do was get the code and enter it in, then it would give you the key to unlock the door. I grabbed my backpack and suitcase and went to enter the code, but I noticed there were already tracks leading up to the door. I told my dad, and he said it was probably the cleaning person or something. I took his word for it and went to open the door. Walking inside, I saw a bit of water on the floor. Again, I assumed it was from the cleaning lady. Other than that though, it looked fine and just how I remembered. I went to my room that I'd always stay in and I started to unpack, but when I went to close the blinds on the window, I saw tracks again. It looked like they were coming from the woods and up towards our house, and judging by the snowfall, they had to be fresh. I told my dad, and he said he would check it out. By the time we got everything unloaded though, the snowfall had gone from sprinkling to almost blizzard-like. My dad said if anyone was out there, they're definitely not anymore if they're smart. He made spaghettios for me and my mom, and we watched a movie. Then I went off to bed. I was awoken a few hours later to a thumping on the wall. It had sounded like it was coming from outside my window. I tried to go back to sleep, but it happened a few more times, and at this point I wasn't even scared, but more annoyed really. I got up and checked outside the window and saw nothing. The snow had let up a bit, so it was easier to see. I noticed the tracks again though, almost the same place they were the first time, coming from the woods. I made sure the windows were locked before going back to bed, as I couldn't really do anything about it anyways. The next day, I told my dad, and he seemed skeptical. We went out there together, and sure enough, there were human footsteps leading from the woods to our cabin, right up to my bedroom window, then to the front door, and then back to the woods. We've been here before, and we know that besides the cabin, there's nothing for miles, and no one ever really camps in the woods, especially during winter. My dad called up his friends and told them about it but still, no one could really do anything. After a few hours though, they brought over some mini cameras that you plug into the wall and then you could see a live feed of your home. We set them up inside to make us feel safer. It was a hassle, but better safe than sorry. We left for the lake a few hours later, with my mom constantly checking the cameras and making sure nobody else was inside the cabin. When we arrived to the spot, we all left our phones in the car while we fished for some time. 
When we got back to the car though, my mom had a ton of notifications about the camera sensing movement. My dad immediately called his friend to go check the cabin or call the police. His friend stayed on the line while he went inside the house with some type of gun. After a few minutes of silence, he said nothing was there. I know he should have waited for the police, but my dad's friends are just a different breed. He called the police anyway and explained the situation. We didn't get any video proof though because the cheap cameras only showed live feed and didn't actually save footage. We stayed with my dad's friend the next few nights, but kept the camera up in the cabin. Sure enough, on the day we were leaving, it sensed movement again. My dad and his friend rushed over there, but again, nothing was inside. But this time, there were tracks leading from the woods to the cabin, the same tracks I saw on the first and second day. My dad thought about following the tracks, but my mom urged him not to. It's a bit eerie to think that someone could have been inside while we were sleeping or watching us from the windows during the day. Nothing ever came of it though, thank god, but it was still one of the creepiest experiences in my life. The next few times we went up there, we stayed in a different cabin and nothing happened. My dad's friend said they never found out what was going on there, and I guess the person stopped coming after we left. My girlfriend left me two weeks before this. I know two weeks is not long enough to fully process a breakup and start using Tinder, but I was desperate. Within a few days, I had two girls I was talking to regularly. I asked them both out on a date for separate days, hoping one of them would be a good match for me. Unfortunately, the first one ghosted me though, so I was left with just the one, making me even more desperate. In her picture, she seemed like my perfect type. Blonde hair, blue eyes, and just really attractive. Her personality, however, left much to be desired, at least over text. She was bland and bad at conversation, but some people are just better in person, so I figured I'd give it a shot and continue with the date. I decided on a cheap restaurant that she agreed was close enough to her. On the night of the date, I got ready and drove down, then texted her that I was there and stood out in front of the restaurant. I was five minutes early, so I wasn't expecting her to show up right away, but after waiting for 20 minutes, I tried calling her. The phone rang for a few, then she answered. Hey, where are you? I'm right outside the place. I said. I waited a few seconds. Hello? She hung up without saying a word. Great, another girl ghosted me. I was embarrassed and annoyed. I got back in my car and drove home. I made myself a bowl of cereal, then chilled on the couch and tried to forget about life for a while. I passed out around 8, still on the couch. When I woke up, I reached for my phone to check the time, but I couldn't find it. I opened my eyes a bit wider and sat up, still searching for my phone. During my search, I caught something in the corner of my eye. My back door was slightly open, just barely, not even enough to see through the crack between the door, but open slightly enough so that it wasn't even with the wall, kind of like someone had pulled it partially closed so that it wouldn't make the click sound. I stood still, looking around. Everything felt like it became so quiet. I took one last quick search for my phone, then gave up and walked over to the back door. It was just as I'd said, barely not closed. I always kept every door locked, so this was a terrifying thing to see after napping just a few feet away. I thought maybe when the intruder saw me on the couch, they must have just left, but then I started thinking about my phone being gone. What if they'd stolen my phone? They would have had to be right in front of me, just inches away, probably watching me sleep. A shiver ran through my body. These thoughts were just making me more scared. I pushed the door shut and locked it, praying that whoever it was had already left. I then walked around the first floor, checking the rooms, but not finding anything worth noting. Then I went upstairs, which for some reason had me more scared. I walked down the hallway, 
looking in each room before I got to my bedroom. I looked around the room, under the bed, everywhere. No signs of anyone. I stepped back into the hall, closing the door. I just thought to myself how creepy this was and tried to think of the best way to contact the police without my phone. But then I heard something. Quiet, soft breathing, echoing inside the closet behind me. I froze. The longer I stood there, the more horrified I was. I ran for the stairs and went out the front door. There was a gas station at the end of the block, so I ran all the way there and got them to call the police. By the time everything was settled, nobody was in my home anymore. My phone was still missing, but that was the only thing that was gone. My account was backed up though, so it wasn't too hard to get a new phone and transfer all my apps and data. A few weeks later though, I went back on Tinder and that's when I started putting pieces together. The girl that ghosted me and creepily answered my phone call no longer existed. I thought that it would actually be possible for them to have gone to the restaurant, but instead of meeting me, followed me home. As for why they took my phone, I'm not sure. The only reason I can really think of is so that I couldn't call the police or show them their account. There's still a lot that doesn't make sense though, like why they only took my phone, and what they were doing in my house while I was sleeping. I'm a 26 year old female, and at the time I was 23 and in college. I used Tinder throughout the second half of my college years. I wasn't exactly looking for a long term relationship, but I also wasn't entirely avoiding it either. If things seemed more serious, then I'd try, otherwise we'd just have some fun and move on. After school on Friday, I went back to my dorm and sat in bed, swiping left and right on the app. I was hoping to have something to do over the weekend. After some time, one of the guys responded. We talked it up for an hour or so, then he asked me out on a date for Sunday night. I agreed, though it was rather quick to ask me out. We texted for a while longer, mostly about school and hobbies. He said he went to the same school as me, but was in the dorm building on the opposite side of the campus. Anyway, on Saturday we texted back and forth a few more times, and come Sunday I met him at a popular restaurant not far from the campus. Over dinner, he didn't strike me as anything but a normal person, so normal that he was almost a little boring. I found him attractive though, and thought he was maybe holding back on a lot due to just meeting me. Once we finished, we went outside and set another date for the next week. As I said goodbye and started walking away, he asked me if I needed a ride home. Living in the dorms at the campus, I didn't have a car, so I just walked everywhere, including the restaurant. I was surprised he even had a car, since he lived at the school as well. But I was even more surprised that he offered me a ride. It seemed like he was trying to make his move for tonight, which I wasn't expecting. But seeing as I enjoyed my time with him, and he was just like any other guy, I took him up on the offer. The campus was a 25 minute walk away, so if nothing else, at least I'd be back sooner. He showed me over to his car, which was just an older black Honda SUV. I got into the passenger seat and he started driving. As soon as we were on the road, things started to get awkward. I tried making small talk, but he wasn't really responding, so I sat back and neither of us talked. After a few minutes, he took a left turn. The campus was to the right, in the complete opposite direction. I felt a lump in my throat and my body got stiff. That feeling of something awful about to happen had fallen over me. Hey, I think you missed the turn. I said nicely, trying to hide any hint of fear in my voice. No, he muttered. I was looking over at him, but his gaze was locked on the road. Where are you taking me? He didn't respond. 
I didn't know what else to ask. I told him to let me out of the car in one last effort to get out of the situation without anything escalating. He still didn't respond. The further out he drove, the more remote the area became. My head was aching from the fear of getting too far out to be able to find any way out of this. I still had my phone in my pocket, which I knew he was going to take as soon as we stopped wherever he was taking me. My plan, and really my only plan, was to try to take out my phone as quickly as possible and dial 911 before he would have time to react. I waited until he started making a turn, and right when he looked the other way, I pulled my phone out and with shaky hands dialed 911. He noticed immediately, trying to grab my phone mid-turn and jerking the car. I was able to keep myself away from grasp while the phone rang, and as soon as I heard a voice on the other side, I yelled for help, saying the street names and direction we were going. The man was still fighting me for my phone, hitting me and pulling me toward him. In the midst of the fight, he lost control of the car and ran off the road straight into a speed limit sign. I was dizzy and my vision was blurry, probably from a concussion, but I could hear the operator on the phone talking from somewhere under my seat. I almost forgot the situation I was in, but once it came back to me, I immediately looked over. The windshield was shattered and the airbags were out, but the man I was with was gone. I tried to see out the windows, but he was nowhere. I didn't even remember seeing the windshield shatter or the airbags go off, so I might have even been unconscious for a few seconds or minutes without knowing it. I searched for my phone, telling the operator what happened and that I was okay. Officers came soon after. I had no lasting injuries, just some pains around my body, but what hurts the most is that I was so sure they would catch the man having his name, description, and license plate. But I was wrong. The car was stolen the day before, which was probably why he abandoned it after the crash. His name was likely fake, although it was a really generic name anyway, and his Tinder account was removed. So, all they have is a description of what he looked like. I should have been more careful, and I definitely have been ever since. What he planned on doing with me is something too awful for me to even think about. I just really hope that he's not out there trying to do the same thing to someone else. I met a man who I'll name as John on Tinder. He was kind and well-spoken, and we had gone on four or five dates before he invited me over to his home. I'd known him for almost a month and was ready for this next step to start dating outside of the public scene. I drove over to his house at 6.30 where he said he would have a nice homemade dinner ready for us. Driving up to his house, there were two cars in the driveway. I never asked if he had roommates or anything, so I thought maybe that's what this was. I didn't see it as a bad thing, but just something that he should have told me before coming over. I drove back around and parked on the curb in front of his house. I walked up to the door and rang the doorbell. John opened the door quickly with a big smile and invited me in. By now, I'd already decided in my mind that this probably isn't the right guy for me, but I didn't want to be disrespectful and fully commit to ending things after just seeing his house for the first time. The kitchen was less messy, seeming like it had been cleaned up recently. On the table were two plates of food, but after seeing the place, I didn't have an appetite anymore. I kindly told him that my stomach wasn't feeling well today and that I'd try to eat it later. His reaction, though, was off-putting. He just looked at me as if he was shocked by my answer and was in deep thought about what to say. I couldn't look him in the eyes for more than a few seconds before it just got weird. When I looked away, I think he snapped out of it. Oh, okay, it's cool. Then he took my plate and put it in the fridge. I started up a conversation, asking how his day was and if anything new was going on with him. 
He answered normally, but it seemed like something else was on his mind. He was looking around, trying to be sneaky about it, and seemed almost nervous. Him looking around reminded me about the cars in the driveway. Hey, I saw you had a bunch of cars in the driveway. Do you have roommates? I asked politely. Uh, yeah. They're away for the weekend, though. He said. Then he got up and excused himself, saying he had to take a call, and walked back toward the living room. The way he was acting was nothing like before. I didn't like it at all. I heard him softly talking on the phone for 30 seconds, then he came back and set his phone down on the table. Sorry, he said, sitting down. I smiled, but it was getting hard to fake it. I didn't really feel safe or comfortable in his house, so I knew I needed to leave. He was looking around again, and I was just trying to get the courage to tell him that I was going to go, until a thump came from upstairs. Right when it sounded, John looked directly at me, as if checking whether or not I heard it. Give me a second. He got up and quickly walked up the stairs, and just a moment later, his phone that was still sitting on the table lit up. Normally I wouldn't snoop on someone's business like that, but I felt justified given this whole ordeal. I stood up and leaned over, seeing it was a text from a number that wasn't saved as a name. The text was short, reading, Do you have her yet? I stood there in a panic for a second, trying to wrap my head around the text, before I heard footsteps coming back down the stairs. I sprinted out the front door, as footsteps were quickly coming behind me from inside the house. I got in my car and floored it out of the neighborhood. I took some time to calm down as I sat in my car in my driveway, then I called the police. I didn't know if there was something going on or not, but I don't feel like I was in the wrong for believing there was. Why would he lie about nobody being home, and what was that text supposed to mean? It all added up in my mind, but the police questioned John, along with his roommate that was upstairs. They even allowed the officers to do a quick search of the home, but they found nothing pointing to any bad intentions. The officers sympathized, saying they understood my concerns and that they would have felt the same, but there just wasn't anything else they could do. So now I'm left to just hope that I took it all the wrong way and there was nothing else going on. Just a simple lie he told, and a strange message that meant nothing. This happened to me several years ago when I was in college. It was just after finals and winter break was starting, so they gave us a little under a week to get our stuff together and leave for the month. I'm not sure if all colleges did this, but ours didn't allow students to stay in the dorms during large breaks, like winter and summer. Anyway, my parents were supposed to come on the very last day possible. I didn't have much to pack, so I just waited. During these days though, I said bye to all my friends and the whole building was pretty much emptied immediately. It was winter break after all, so everyone was eager to leave. My parents were driving though, and they had busy lives, so that's just how it was for me. I honestly didn't mind the quiet though, but it was the night before my parents were going to arrive, and basically no students were here anymore. Around 10 o'clock, I got ready for bed and turned off the lights in my room. I don't think it was even 5 minutes later when a knock came from my door. I jumped, as it kind of freaked me out. I had no idea who could possibly be at my door given all the people I knew had already left. Not to mention, it was 10pm. Regardless, I got up and went over to the door. When I opened it, I was surprised to see a large, young man standing there, bundled up in a winter jacket. He looked like a student though. Can I help you with something? I asked. He asked me if I'd seen a guy here. He didn't give me a name, but rather just described his features. Before answering, I asked why. I had no idea who I was talking to or why he was at my door, so I wanted some answers first. He stumbled out a few words before settling on saying that he was his roommate and he wasn't sure where he went. But if he was his roommate, then why didn't he just give me a name? 
It all seemed really weird. I wasn't sure how to respond, and stood there for a moment, thinking of what to do, before he interrupted my thoughts and asked me something really bizarre. Can I check if he's in your room? I immediately said no and began shutting the door. The guy stopped me though, putting his hand on the other side. He wasn't trying to push it open, but he was pushing hard enough to keep me from closing it. I told him to back off as sternly as I could, but he again asked me to check my room. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, but I knew I needed to find a way out of this quick before it escalated to something a lot worse. I only had a few seconds to think, and I realized in those moments that I'd already messed up by opening the door in the first place. I guess spending so much time living in a dorm, I never had a reason to fear opening my door. I backed up, letting the guy open it fully. He smiled. I gestured with my hand, allowing him to come inside. I barely had anything in here, nothing worth stealing if that's what he was after, so I hoped this would get him to be in and out quickly. As soon as he took a few steps and passed me in the room, I walked out the door and into the hallway. He turned and looked at me, as if I had offended him by walking out. I just didn't want to be trapped in a small room with this random big dude. He glanced around my room for a few seconds, then he came back into the hallway, and without saying another word, he left. I had no clue what just happened, but the more thought I gave it, the crazier it seemed. Thinking about his appearance, I knew it was snowing so it wasn't odd that he was wearing thick winter clothing, but what was odd was that he seemed to have just come from outside. His jacket had water droplets from recently melted snow, and his nose was red like he'd been out in the cold, snowy night for a while. I just didn't understand what random student would go straight from outside to my dorm room on the third floor and knock on my door at 10pm. Why was he even asking me? How did he know I was here? There's a hundred rooms in this building, and he happened to knock on mine. Nothing made sense at all, and it kept me up all night. I even moved my small dresser in front of my door, just in case. Before my parents picked me up on the following day, I decided to walk over to the police department across the street. When I told them what happened, they seemed to be a lot more interested than I had expected. I answered a ton of questions, until finally they told me what was going on after ruling me out from being a suspect. A kid on the floor below mine was missing yesterday morning when his parents came to pick him up. He had no roommate, and with the building so empty, it made the case a lot more difficult. Obviously, hearing about the guy at my dorm last night, they were thinking it may be a good lead. But days turned to weeks, and then months. I don't know what happened, as it's been many years. I think back about how that guy at my room knew that someone was missing and said it was his roommate, but obviously he was lying. I don't think he ever turned up either. I also think about why he came to my room specifically, and if he planned to make me go missing as well. He also could have just been some random guy looking for his friend, but that seems unlikely due to all the coincidences. There's so much I don't know, and unfortunately, we'll probably never know. I live in the Western Territory of Wyoming. Most of Wyoming is made up of small towns and long roads going between them. I live in one of these towns, consisting of maybe 40 to 50 buildings total, and barely the area of a square mile. The next nearest town is an hour drive away. Anyway. My cottage-type home is down a trail away from the center of town. I live alone with my dog Sam, but I find it peaceful, at least for right now. I never found that I had to worry about anything, being so far away from civilization. But one night, I realized that that was exactly why I should be worried. I worked from home, so just like any other day, I worked until 5 and then got off and took my dog for a long walk. We would often go through a trail I made in the forest behind our house. It was the middle of winter though, so it was fairly cold and there was a light snowfall. I walked Sam for maybe 20 minutes before the sun began setting and I decided it best to turn around and head back to the house. Along our walk back, Sam perked his head up and stopped suddenly, staring ahead. 
It was somewhat dark at this point, but I could still see clear enough that nothing was there. I kept walking forward and Sam eventually followed. But a few steps later, I noticed something on the path. I got closer. There were footprints in the thin layer of snow. While it was already odd for there to be footprints on a self-made trail next to my isolated home, what was more odd was the direction in which they were going. They went across the trail, not along it. And, based on the angle, they were going straight through the trees in the direction of my house. I would have noticed them on our way up the path, so they had to be recent, within the last ten minutes for sure. I tugged Sam along, walking quickly on the trail as the snow began to pick up. When we exited the tree line, it was too dark and snowy to even see the house clearly. Getting closer though, a really bad, unnerving feeling came across me. I felt safer with Sam next to me, but something just didn't feel right. I went up to the front door and opened it. Sam seemed to be acting normal, so I felt a bit of relief. I took his collar and leash off, but after a few minutes, I couldn't shake the thought of those footprints in the snow. I decided I needed peace of mind and grabbed my coat to go check and make sure that no footprints were around the house. It was really dark and the snow was heavy now. I walked around the side and started looking for any signs of anything, but with so much snow I was sure it would be covered up by now. Still, I just wanted to make sure. I was on the left side of my house, seeing nothing at all, when Sam suddenly started barking from inside. It startled me, but I immediately ran back around to the front and went inside. I called out for Sam, running through the living room and over to the back door where I saw him standing. His tail was between his legs and he was staring at the back door intensely. I hurried over to him, his gaze not even shifting from the door. My adrenaline was rushing through me by now, getting really scared. Looking over at the back door more closely, my heart stopped when I saw water on the floor inside the house right by the doormat. I switched on the backyard light, seeing footprints going right up to the door, then back out and around the side of the house. I was really scared and quickly ran to grab my hunting rifle from the other room. I know it's not the most practical self-defense weapon, but it was intimidating at least. I felt trapped and at a disadvantage, unknowing of who this person was where they were, or what they wanted. But, seeing as they tried entering my house, they were willing to risk their life for whatever it was they were after. The footprints went off to the right side of the house though, so I ran over to that area of the home and turned on the lights, then opened the blinds on the window. Just as I opened the blinds, I heard loud, heavy footsteps running away from the window. Sam began barking again, and I tried to look out, but I couldn't see anything through the snow. I stayed on high alert for hours, unsure of what exactly to do. Police in this area weren't exactly able to provide as much service as they may do in more populated areas, so I really was on my own for the most part. Thankfully, that seemed to be the end of it though. I notified the police of the incident the next morning, but I never found any answers. I don't know who it was or what they were trying to do. It was extremely creepy though, and made me a bit more uncomfortable with living so far from others. But luckily I still have Sam with me, because without him scaring the intruder away, I don't know if I'd be here right now. I drive for a local grocery chain in my area. It's not a full-size semi-truck, it's more of a large van, but I usually have an 8-10 to 10 hour route that goes between 3-4 to four stores. It's a pretty simple job that pays nice enough and gives me little to no stress. The only time things do get stressful is in winter. The van struggles in the snowy conditions and with thousands of dollars worth of cargo in the back, it puts a bit of stress on me. This winter had been worse than most, with more snowfall, ice, and foggy conditions. On this particular day, I had to stop at four stores. It was snowing a decent amount, but the plows were keeping up with the roads so there wasn't too many issues. By the time I finished unloading the last of the cargo at the fourth store, it was 8 o'clock and the snow had started piling up a bit more on the road. 
dark, snowy, and unplowed roads are never a good combo when driving. One thing to mention as well is that large trucks and vans have an easier time managing the snow when they are heavier, giving them more traction. So, with no more cargo in the back of my van, I had to drive extra carefully since the back wheels were lighter and could slide out easily. The start of the drive back went well, but the further out I got towards the warehouse, the less plowed the roads were. There was a long stretch of road that leads directly to the warehouse, and I was worried that it may not be plowed at all, given the state of the main roads. This wasn't a main entrance to the warehouse lot either, but it was a less busy side route that a lot of us drivers use frequently when coming in from the south, as it saves nearly 5 minutes of driving. Turning onto this road though, I was surprised to see it was actually plowed recently, barely any snow on it at all. This was rare because this road only leads to warehouse buildings, so it wasn't seen as a priority for plowing companies. Thankful for this, I rolled down the road at a steady pace. I don't remember what I was thinking about, probably just my plans for the rest of the night after I got off, when out of nowhere, the road ahead was packed full of snow. I slammed on my brakes, and luckily I was able to stop just before I hit the snow, but it definitely got me awake and a bit dazed. I looked up, and in the headlights was a completely unplowed road for the rest of the way up to the warehouse. I'd never seen a road only plowed halfway, with such a sudden stop. There wasn't even anywhere to turn around, so they must have just plowed all the way up here, and then backed all the way out. I couldn't believe it. After a minute, I was getting a bit angry actually. Who would do something like this? I left my van on, but got out and looked at the road. It was really cold and snowy, but I could see clear tracks from multiple vehicles. I turned and looked down the road where I came, and not far from the back of my van, I saw something on the ground. I walked over and got a closer look. On the road was a bunch of equipment, like parts to something. I didn't know what they were, but they looked expensive and definitely didn't belong on the road. It seemed like they'd fallen out of a truck that was heading to the warehouse. I got back inside my van and started backing out. At the time, I was telling myself that I was just being dramatic, but I couldn't help but feel like I was in the middle of some weird crime scene. When I made it off the road, I pulled around and drove the extra minutes around to the front of the warehouse and took the main entrance. As I was pulling up though, my work phone started buzzing. The night manager at the warehouse was calling me, which was extremely rare. I picked up and they immediately asked if I was okay, then told me to take the main entrance and not the back route. I just said okay, since I was already at the warehouse, but then I went inside to talk to him and figure out what was going on. Apparently, he had just gotten word in from a neighboring warehouse that one of their drivers got jumped and robbed on the back road. He said the police were already on their way as well. Hearing that, everything made sense in my head and I fell silent for a second then told him what happened to me. It didn't take long for the guys to get caught though, because the expensive equipment they stole turned out to be highly secured and had internal trackers. It was a group of young men who admitted to making the road into a trap where they would follow a truck once they turned in and then block their only exit once they reached the dead end. Then, of course they'd rob the cargo and hold the driver at gunpoint while they did it. I was creeped out for a while, unsure of what to think. I'd never had something like that happen to me before, so it's strange for me to think that if I'd arrived only a few minutes earlier, I would have been caught in a trap and had a gun to my head. I work for a janitorial company that cleans office buildings in the city. We have set schedules for each building and most of the time they request cleanings to be done outside of work hours. So, most jobs I did were between 5pm and 7am. It varied depending on the building we were servicing that day. On this night, I was working with my coworker, RJ, and we were set to do a basic cleaning in a 5 story office building. The floors in this place were really big, mostly filled with rows of cubicles. This was booked for our whole 8 hour shift, but it wasn't uncommon for it to take longer. We started working at 6. 
RJ went to the top floor to work his way down, and I started on the bottom floor to work my way up, planning to meet each other on the middle third floor and finish up together. I started by rolling my trash bin over to each cubicle and taking out their trash, then the bathroom and main offices. Then I got my cleaning supplies from my cart and started cleaning the bathroom. While I was scrubbing the sinks though, I heard the front door of the building open. I thought RJ had just forgotten something in the van, but a couple minutes went by and I didn't hear the door open again. Once I finished scrubbing the sinks, I went to the front door and looked outside, seeing the van was off and the doors were closed, and it looked empty. I figured I just didn't notice him coming back in, or maybe I didn't notice him leaving, and the door opening was him actually coming back inside. Whatever, I thought. It wasn't a big deal. I went back to work. After an hour or so, I finished up on the first floor and moved to the second, this floor was almost identical to the first, except it had a small reception desk in front of the stairs. I started with the trash again, and while doing this, I heard another door open. I could tell it was from upstairs, but I didn't know which floor until I heard footsteps. They walked slowly across the floor above me, toward the back of the building. I knew it was on the third floor above me, but RJ could not have finished two floors in just over an hour. It just wasn't possible. I went to the stairs and onto the third floor to see what he was doing. There was a main door, and behind it was a long hallway filled with closed-in offices. I listened for a second to see if I could pinpoint where he was, but it was silent. RJ? I took a few more steps into the hallway, but I started getting creeped out. I backed out and went to the fourth floor. Right when I opened the door, I saw RJ standing in the middle of the room, cleaning with his headphones in. Hey, were you on the third floor just now? He took his headphones out and said no, looking at me like he was confused. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. I'm just starting on my second floor, so I'll see you in a couple hours. He nodded and went back to work. I went back downstairs and splashed some water on my face. I didn't feel that tired, but I knew I had to be imagining these things. At least, I thought so. I turned the sink off and patted my face down with a paper towel. And just before I left the bathroom, I heard a door open. It was from the main area on my floor. I waited in the bathroom as whoever was out there started walking around. I stayed for a minute, then opened the bathroom door just barely enough to look into the main room. In the far back was a man. He was facing away from me, walking slowly down the aisles of cubicles. It was so strange because he was just walking not looking around or doing anything else. I watched this guy walk all the way down, then he stopped by the window. I walked further out and into the main room. Hey, you okay man? I don't think you're supposed to be in here. I said, trying to sound nice and not too provoking. The guy turned around and looked at me. He was far away, but I could see emptiness in his eyes like he was looking straight through me. I waited only a couple seconds for a response before I quickly walked out of the room. He still didn't move or say anything. I ran up to the fourth floor where RJ was. He was still cleaning and didn't seem to have noticed anything. I convinced him to come down to the van with me where we called the police and I explained what happened. The police came a few minutes later and searched the building but came out empty-handed. They reviewed the security footage of that night though, and saw the man walk inside around the same time that I said I heard the door open. He stayed in the stairwell for a long time, then he walked up to the third floor, and slowly walked around each room. Then he went to the second floor, where you could see him walk down to the window. 
After my interaction with him, the man left the building as I went to get RJ. His intentions are unknown, but that empty look he gave me and the way he was just walking around were some of the creepiest things I have ever seen. And four months later, even with his face clearly shown on the footage, no one has been able to find or identify him. There was a period in my life where my parents were going through a rough patch. I lived alone in a small apartment and took my six-year-old brother in while my parents figured out their situation. I was lucky enough to work from home, so watching my little brother wasn't too much of a burden and it made me feel a lot better to have him there with me. My parents had a history of bad arguments and I didn't want him to experience that harshness while growing up. This happened to me during this short two-month time period. Two weeks in, my job scheduled an in-person meeting to be held during the second half of our workday on a Friday afternoon. This was a normal monthly meeting that we had to discuss our progress on our projects. With my brother being so young, he of course needed a babysitter to watch him while I was gone. I called a local babysitting service that I found online and got it scheduled. I didn't choose a specific person, I just let them give me whoever was available at that time frame. Come Friday, I got my little brother ready and made sure everything was set on the counter for the babysitter. At noon, the babysitter, who I'll call Chris, came to the door of the apartment building. I buzzed him in and showed him inside. He looked to be between 18 and 20 years old, and from the few minutes I met him before I left, he seemed to be very caring and nice, just like any babysitter should be. I thanked him for helping me out and left for the meeting. The meeting took a few hours, and by 5.30 I was heading back home. In-person meetings always drained me because I was so used to working from home, so the drive back felt long and tiring. I parked by the front of the building and headed inside, then walked upstairs to my room. I unlocked the door, and immediately, something felt wrong. The lights were all off, and it was really quiet. Chris? I called out in the doorway. I stepped in and turned on the light. The worry hit me, and I got really scared. I ran down the hall into the living room. Right on the couch was my little brother. I gave him a big hug, then asked where Chris was. He said he left, but that was all I could get him to say. I called the babysitting company, but they said they hadn't heard anything from him either. They tried calling him, and he didn't answer. They apologized and gave me a refund for the service, but that really didn't make me feel better. Nothing looked to have been stolen though, and my brother was okay, so after an hour, I just dropped it. I made dinner for us and turned on a show for him to watch before bed. I started cleaning the dishes in the sink, which was facing the front door, when I had a sudden realization. I had to unlock the door when I got home. I never gave Chris keys to the house, and the only way to lock the bolt lock on the door was with the key, or from inside the house. I dropped what I was doing and grabbed my little brother, then ran out of the apartment. We sat in my car while I called the police. I saw one of the blinds in my bedroom window move while I was on the phone, and a minute later, Chris ran out of the front of the apartment building and got in his car, driving away. Police came, and later that night, Chris was found in his apartment. He made up a whole story, but it didn't make any sense and didn't fool anyone. It's likely that his plan was to do something to me later that night, then disappear. They found what they described as a travel kit in his car, with provisions, survival tools, and blankets. His apartment was also cleaned out, so he'd been planning on doing something like this for a while. This was definitely the most disturbing close call I've ever had. I'm glad it was just that, though, a close call, because it could have been so much more disturbing than it already was if I hadn't gotten out in time. I had just gotten home from work at 8. 
I picked up some food on the way home, so I just sat down at the table to eat while watching YouTube on my phone. While I was still taking my food out of the bag and setting it on the table, the doorbell rang. It was raining outside, and I had literally gotten home 20 seconds ago, so I was not expecting someone to be at my door so suddenly. I went over to the front door and opened it. A man stood on my porch, looking soaked and cold. Hi, can I help you? I said. The man asked me if I'd let him take shelter in my house for the night, because he didn't have anywhere else to stay. I felt bad for him, but I wasn't going to just let some random man stay in my house. I apologized and said no, then closed the door. I waited to make sure he left, but after a minute I hadn't heard any footsteps leaving. I looked out the peephole and saw the man still standing there. He was facing the driveway, looking out into the rain. I thought he was maybe taking shelter on my porch for a bit before going back out which I guess I didn't mind, so long as he left within the next few minutes. I went back to my food and sat down to eat. I had a lot of stuff from work on my mind, so that man on the porch wasn't a big concern of mine. When I finished eating, I put a show on and rested my eyes for a while. Thirty or so minutes later, the doorbell rang again. I almost didn't even want to answer, but when I looked out the peephole, I saw a young boy, looking to be maybe 13 or 14 years old. I opened the door, and the boy was about to ask me something, but I interrupted him and asked what he was doing out here alone and where his parents were. He paused, like he was thinking of a response, but then he just ignored my questions and said he was looking for shelter because he didn't have anywhere to stay. There was something wrong and I knew it the moment those words came out of his mouth. With the boy being so young though, it was a really strange situation. I told him to stay on the porch for just a minute, then I closed the door and ran to get my phone. I had a feeling that if I told the boy I was calling the police, then he'd run away, so I didn't tell him. I called 911 and let them know that a boy was at my house claiming to be homeless. I made the call quick, then ran back to the door. I opened the door quickly, but standing on my porch were three grown men, including the one I'd seen earlier that night. I slammed the door shut immediately as one of the men rushed at me and pushed their body against the door. I locked it just before he turned the handle. I was screaming and crying as I backed away from the door. They were pounding on it and trying to force the handle to turn. After 30 seconds though, it went quiet. I heard footsteps running away, and then it was over. Just the sound of rain hitting the roof. The police came and took a report from me with descriptions of the men and the boy that I saw. They had a similar incident earlier that week of likely the same group using the boy as bait to get the homeowner to let them inside. Then the whole group came in and violently robbed them. One of the men was caught a few days later while robbing a store, but as for the boy and the other two men, I don't think they were ever found.